Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, today we have a special guest in Chris Richard. Chris has been on the channel a few times and always great feedback when we have him on. So we thought we'd bring him on again and just do kind of a, a first half of 2022 review what's going on in the markets and get a little feedback from a professional in the industry. So Chris, thanks for joining us again today. No, not a problem at all. So I'll kind of go through what we talked about probably in the first couple of times I was on. And a lot of people say, you know, I have a 60-40 portfolio. It's kind of an all-weather portfolio. You know, the four most dangerous words in investing is this time is different. Uh, this time, <laughs> this time, unfortunately, it was a bit different. The main reason as to why we're having such trouble, you know, in the markets right now is, is just inflation is at like a generational high, right? We've seen in the US, I believe it was last Thursday or Friday, I saw two things that I never thought I'd see in my entire life. The US said, we have inflation that's 9.1%. I never thought I'd see that in my entire life. And it's not just in one sector, right? It's 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 everything. It happens to be, you know, in services and goods. It's happened to be in energy, commodities, anything that's like food. It, it You can't escape it. There's a main reason for that, right? It, it, we have to be having, you know, two things happening at the same time. We have demand inflation because there's there's tons of people that have a tremendous amount of extra savings, as well as we have unemployment rate at an all-time low here in Canada. So it's a lot more people with money, right? And then they're chasing the same amount of goods or fewer goods that pushes prices up. But what happens is also we've had supply line issues with not only the China's no COVID policy, but also the war in Eastern Europe has really pushed supply chains to limit and even broken some of them. So at a certain point, you know, we just have more dollars chasing fewer goods. And what that does is that just leads, you know, to an inflation at 9.1%. And people say this is now bolstering, you know, the case for the central banks around the world to really take out the big sticks and start raising rates and quantitative tightening. That's already happened. You can kind of see here on, on jumbo rate hikes. I mean, there's been places all over the planet that have raised at north of 100 basis points, including the Bank of Canada. That hasn't happened in a tremendously long period of time. And it's not normal. The reason why it's not normal is central banks around the world like to, to manage inflation around a 2% level to be 7% points higher than that, especially in, a, in an advanced economy like, like the US. Like this shouldn't happen. And what's occurred is they just got it wrong. And in their defense, they're not the only ones that got it wrong. And to even bolster more of their defense, they're landing like a 787 Dreamliner on a runway made for a crop duster, right? The margin of error is so small. Mm -hmm. We have so many pushing and pulling different sources, but the banks are now reacting to an, an issue that has already been felt pretty much throughout the rest of what's known as the rate curve. So the Bank of Canada, when they say they're raising rates, they raise the overnight rate, which is the really, really short term rate. What has already occurred is the rest of the, the interest rates from the Bank of Canada have already responded, right? So you can kind of see here on the Bank of Canada 10 year rate, you know, we're already up in probably se in seven months, about 1.74, 1.8%. Which is over double. <laughs> it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a big move, right? It is a huge move. That's kind of why your portfolio, especially the fixed income part of your portfolio is attributable to why it's underperformed probably the past 20, 30 years that you've had. Because as we talked about the past, right, as rates go up, face value of bonds come down. When that happens, it, it's ubiquitous across the curve, right? So if you own, you know, really, really good credit from a really good company, you can't outrun a rising rate environment. The other piece that happens to be throwing, especially if you own corporate debt, is as we raise rates here in Canada, we're trying to really slow the economy, right? We're trying to bring demand way, way down so that supply can catch up, right? And Bank Canada's governor pretty much said the same thing, right? Where he's looking to just give supply a chance to catch up, right? So that we can get prices back to where they meet, where we're not going up at nine, eight, nine points right per year. Problem is the cat's already out of the bag. So I, I ran the XBB, which is an ETF that's that's going to try and track the uh, Canada bond index. And, and what you can see is like you're you're down double digits, and majority of that comes from December 2021 onward, mm -hmm. right? So that's just because that's when all of a sudden people around the world were kind of like, oh boy, right? We <laughs> we've we've got inflation really kind of cooking here, and we're going to start to see rates go higher. 
because a the central banks around the world are not going to be buying bonds in quantitative uh, easing. We're actually going to be tightening accommodations. All of a sudden, you take out the biggest player, rates go higher. Just kind of what's happened. And you can kind of see even the performance year to date down 11.86%. Over five years, if you own this ETF, you compound it at 40 basis points. Crazy. Like, holy smokes. That that's You just washed out five years pretty much of returns because of how bad these years have been. The impact on higher rates, though, kind of gets felt throughout the rest of the economy, right? So you can kind of see it in a big, you know, bunch of different places. The main one is housing. Right. And that's why the other part of the portfolio has not been performing well, because people are saying like, oh, my goodness, we're going to slow the economy so much that we're going to go into a recession. And, and are we going to go in? I don't know. Right. There, there's a lot of moving parts there. We don't forecast that type of stuff. But what we can see is there's only so many dollars that can go around. So if you kind of look at, say, even like cancellations. On, on housing contracts, they're up north of 15%. That's just because there's only so many dollars that can go around, mm -hmm. right? Especially on housing. In Canada, housing is such a big part. And if you had a you know variable rate mortgage, people would be watching their statements saying, oh my goodness, I'm not paying as much on that principal as, as I thought I was. I read something that back in April, that this was written in April, but the six months prior to that, the Global Mail said, that 50% of the home-related debt that was getting added at that point, 50% of it was variable rate. I locked into variable in January, which in hindsight, oh, it's a terrible idea. But no one has crystal ball. I never saw rates going this high this quickly, right? And again, it goes back to, I wish I had the crystal ball for everything, but you just don't. You don't. And, and I mean, how high can it go? I mean, the, the Bank of Canada assumes that what's known as a neutral rate is between 2 and 3%. Mm -hmm. That is the rate where, you know, you're not stimulating the economy, but you're not holding it back either. And they say that, you know, they might need to go north of three on the front end uh, overnight rate to slow the economy down. Now, will they get there? There's, like I said, there's a ton of things that will move and they go meeting to meeting, right? So as new information comes in, they might say, you know what? We Maybe we don't need to. Or if inflation is still stuck, persistently high, they might say, okay, well, maybe we do need to go a bit higher. But it goes meeting by meeting. But what, what we can kind of know is that there's only so many dollars that can go around. Right? For most Canadians, you have X number of dollars in your salary, and you can only allocate so much to housing. So I pulled up this chart. I found that it was really great. So if you have, say, a $2,500 allotted for your mortgage at 0%, right? You can own a $750,000 house at a 25-year amortization. As you can see, as rates go higher and that $2,500 stays fixed, the only thing that can really move is the amount that you want to borrow, right? Mm -hmm. Because you still have to service that debt. The higher the rate, the more of that servicing goes towards interest. Right. And that's just kind of the way it works. So that's the other piece that a lot of people are watching is, OK, well, how far is the Bank of Canada willing to upend the apple cart to get rates and get inflation back in line? But are they going to throw everything off too much? So what you've kind of seen is this 60-40 portfolio that is an all-weather type portfolio, or as has it been described in the past, you know, it hasn't held up this time because rates are going higher. Because rates are going higher, that's why... The markets have sold off. Yeah. So you can kind of see here, I ran the S&P 500, the TSX, and then that XBB, and they're, <laughs> they're all down year to date, double digits. The reason why the TSX and the S&P 500 are down is because bond rates are going down because we're raising rates, which will slow the economy, which they think will then kind of push us in, into uh, slower growth and companies will have less earnings. That's really what this all boils down to is that there's just a lot of stuff you know, working at the same time that perhaps might be slowing us down and people think perhaps too much. Like in the 17, 18 years I've been in this business, it's always been, you know, bonds. I remember back in the day when, you know, I, I sold mutual funds and it was like, you know, yeah, build that 60, 40 portfolio and the 40% is bonds. And that's like the foundation and safety of your, like build your portfolio on a rock, not sand. And that was the rock. And it's because we've seen interest rates for many years drop. Now we're seeing it go back up. And I think for a lot of people watching this video, when you get your portfolio and your statement now halfway through the year, a lot of you are going to be down 15, 20, 25%. And you're thinking like, well, I don't have a super risky portfolio, like a 60, 40 portfolio. But again, like you said, it's just not holding up anymore. We're in different times. And kind of the foundation of your portfolio is down double digits. And a lot of people have never experienced this before. Oh, no. I mean, 
this is because I think since like the 70s, 80s, I mean, we've had interest rates going really in one direction on on mass, right? And it's gone from the top down to the bottom, you know, mid COVID. It don't really had to rebound because it's not normal to have mortgage rates at like sub 2%, in my opinion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's pretty much like money is relatively free. And what is the appropriate rate for the 10 year in, in Canada and the US? If you kind of think about it in, in terms, if inflation's nine in the US and the government, uh, the US 10 year is three to three and a half, you still have very negative real rates, mm -hmm. right? Relative to, to where inflation is. So still fairly accommodative, but we, you're right. I mean, we've only seen rates kind of go in one direction. And the reason why a lot of people have had perhaps outperformance you know, in the last couple of years, if they were in a growth year portfolio is because rates were going down. And as lower rates specifically during COVID go really low, growthier type of companies do tend to look really attractive because those cash flows that are phenomenal, you know, five, 10 years out, when you discount them at a lower rate, it comes back to today's dollars. All of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, this company is worth, you know, X number of billions of dollars. Well, now when you go from like a one to a three on that discount rate, plus perhaps adding a bit more you know, recession risk in there. So you need to get paid a bit more. All of a sudden you're starting to see maybe growth ETFs aren't the best thing out there. So I ran the IVE, which is a uh, value type ETF and the IVW, which is more of a growthier ETF. And you can just see the difference, right? And the difference is, is striking year to date. And that just has to happen because valuations have come up so far. Uh, and they're just coming back back into line. If rates go down a bit further, all of a sudden companies with cash flows further out uh, that look ro like they're going to survive and they're going to be really robust, they'll still perform well. Mm -hmm. So I, I always feel like I come on here and do like doom and gloom and, and, and people say like, Chris, what do I do with my money? <laughs> what, what to do now? Right. So if you kind of look, you know, this might not be the house view that we've peaked in inflation, but some people are betting that. Right. So people are saying, you know, perhaps, you know, a year from now, inflation gets back in check. You know, mid COVID, Bank of Canada and central banks around the world really were saying that, you know, we don't have, you know, crazy high inflation. It's just base year effect. Well, base year effect is saying prices were so low a year ago that now they're just back to normal. Right. So all of a sudden you're saying, oh, we're at five, six percent inflation. But that's just because the, the you know, the base year is, is a lot lower. You know, eventually we're going to start lapping some very elevated inflation numbers because inflation is a year over year metric. And perhaps the, you know, the comps get a bit easier. So I also pulled this is a commodity screen that Bloomberg has. And you can kind of see here the one year rate stuff's off the chart. This is a really nerdy screen, by the way. It, I know 100%. I know I, you love I, this stuff, but for our clients screen. watching this, they're like, what is going on? It's, so it's kind of like our financial planning screen. It's like, there's too many numbers here, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's more about the general thematic of it is that all well, the blue numbers mean that they're really high year over year. And this is the stuff that is like the inputs into what eventually leads into inflation, right? These are the building blocks. So metals, energy, you know, agriculture. So kind of like the food, energy, as well as metal, everything that goes into stuff you buy, you know, this is kind of the stuff that goes into it. And you got to think like energy gets fed into everything that we buy. Uh, you can't not eat. Right. So these are the, the things that really get impacted on everyday savers and everyday people who have only a finite amount of money. They're like, geez, Louise, I can only spend so much, but I have no other choice. I need to put gas in my car. I need to put dinner on the table for my family and I need to buy goods. Right. But guess what? Every good that gets to your store gets to there by something that pulled it or pushed it with gas in the in the engine or diesel. What we've seen, though, over the last three months is that the three month lap, it's down. Right. So perhaps we are starting to see that relief that perhaps the, you know, the interest rate hikes, which it, it takes time, right? This is an ocean liner positioning into a port. It's not a speedboat, right? So you have to hit, you know, the rising rate and it takes time to move the economy to slow that inflation to kind of see it come in. So it's a lagged effect. Yeah. But we're starting to see it kind of come in. Gas price is finally below $2 over here. I was, I was 180 here and I was just on a, a golf trip, right? And it's, it's below 180. And all those savings kind of go back into your pocket to be able to go and buy. I mean, food's still bloody expensive, right? But you can maybe have a bit more relief. I feel bad for people who, you know, there is a finite amount of money that you have to spend. And inflation is a tax on everybody. Yeah. If you 
are in that top five, 10, 15% of the market, you know, you have extra savings. So maybe you might not save as much, but your quality of life doesn't really differ. Whereas if you are on a fixed income, you sometimes have to choose as to what you're going to be spending money on. And, you know, oftentimes, okay, well, maybe I won't eat lunch or maybe perhaps I, I won't go anywhere because I can't afford to put gas in my car, right? So this tax on everyone is, is really serious. And I think this is where, you know, our clients really feel it because again, a lot of our clients are close to retirement or in retirement and it's prices of everything I do went up 5, 10, 15%. My portfolio is down 5, 10, 15% and I'm on a fixed income. And when you have those two things moving in the opposite directions, like you said, it, it's tough to hold tight, right? And, and, you know, this is part of my job on my end is it's the psychology behind it of, you know, you have to ride these things out. They will come out the other side, but it's painful in the meantime. For us, I mean, the dividend growth philosophy that we follow, I mean, we've had really nice increases in the mm-hmm. cash flow from the dividends uh, from companies that, that are paying it. But if you're right, I mean, if you draw out more than the cash flow generated from your portfolio is, is there to draw, you're eating into capital. Right. And if you're eating into capital a little bit, it's not that scary. But if you're new into retirement and you're drawing a tremendous amount of capital, assuming that markets only went in one direction, eventually you might have to say, okay, I have to make some lifestyle changes here. Right. I can't take X number of dollars. And that's tough, right? Because when you retire, you've saved your entire life to have this pool of capital to survive for that third stage of life. And saving's tough, right? I mean, there's always pushes, pulls, wants, desires to say, I want to have that. I want to go on that trip. I want to do this. And when you retire, you kind of say like, hey, I'm going to hit all that bucket list stuff, right? I'm going to go on those trips. I'm going to buy the convertible. I'm going to do all these things. Oftentimes, you know, when it doesn't work out specifically at the beginning, right? Because if you're 60 and you retire, you know, it's not like when you retired at 60 and you passed away at 68, people retire at 60 now and live to 95. Yeah. So this portfolio is a 30, you know, sometimes a 30, 35 year journey that needs to be there because the backstop of a company funded defined benefit pension plan, it's very rare nowadays, right? So you got CPP and OAS, those only get you so far and they don't get you those extra things that a lot of people want to do. So the one thing that we always kind of tell clients is like, focus on what you can control, yeah. buy good quality businesses. You know, you're going to go through economic cycles, up, downs. If you're going to be retired for 30 years, you're going to go through a lot of things that's going to move your portfolio, right? So just focus in on, on what you can control. Own high quality businesses, own businesses that you know have been around for a very long period of time that are run by phenomenal men and women that you, know, you think have a good you know, prospect for the future. For us, we focus a lot on dividends, dividend growth, company fundamentals, but we do spend a lot of time on management teams because really you're entrusting your capital to these companies to execute. And companies are really just decisions made by men and women and how well, you know, they're going to, you know, work out is dependent on, on a lot of things. But if you have good people working in good companies with good trajectories, you got a good shot. Are they all going to be home runs all the time? No right? They're not, right? But if you buy a good quality business, you know, you're not going to open up the Globe and Mail and be like, oh my goodness, you know, so-and-so like this, you know, crypto guy who, you know, they just closed down the business. They can't find some investors, you know, people went missing. Can bad things happen to good companies? Yeah. Right. But if you focus in on that, you know, your portfolio, you should be doing okay. Like FedEx isn't going away tomorrow. (laughs) I hope not. We have, (laughs) I really like that business. I always say, the, the companies, you know, like I'm invested, obviously, with you guys, a lot of our clients are too. And I always say, like, if one of the companies you guys own goes bankrupt or goes away, you know, RBC, TD, name the company, we got bigger issues in that company going away. Yeah. Which is natural, I mean, right? Like if CN Rail all of a sudden isn't there to chug down the tracks, you're yeah. going to feel it like real life feel it, not your portfolio. You're going to go to a store and be like, wow, where's all the stuff? But I mean, good, big companies have had issues. That's why you don't yeah. diversify your portfolio. Don't say I'm betting on X company because it's going to the moon. I'm taking a hundred percent of my portfolio and I'm going there. Another thing that I've seen clients do is they work for a company and they fully believe in it because what they know. And mm-hmm. they say, I want to put 30% of my overall portfolio in company that I work for. It's going to be great. And I said, it might, but you never want to have your portfolio highly tied to your employment income, right? Because say your company's having hard times, you lose your job. Oh, I lost my job. I need to rely on my portfolio. Oh, my company is falling under hard times. Perhaps the stock price isn't where it needs to be, mm-hmm. right? So just kind of have that diversification. There's no magic bullet. There's no crystal ball. I get asked on a daily basis. Hey, Chris, I know you don't have a crystal ball. 
when do you think the turn's happening? So asking me where my crystal ball is. For me, I don't know, right? I mean, there, I could take a guess, but it's a guess. And I choose not to guess with, with clients' money. We like to buy fundamentally strong businesses that we think over the next three, five, 10 years should do really well. Right. So, I mean, that's kind of where we put our focus. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us in this video. Always great to have you on here, Chris. Well, we'll get you on probably near the end of the year, do another recap of the second half. Hopefully it's a bit better than the first half. And hopefully, uh, hopefully the bonds don't take another 12% hit here going in the next six months. Yeah. I might have less hair next time you have me on if that happens, but uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks.